proper name and the correct spelling? D-I-Z. Mm -hmm. Hanby. H-A-N-B-E-Y. And your maiden name? Wilson. W-I-L-S-O-N. And you were born where and when? Texas. What part? Near Dallas. Small town. Tig. Tig. T-I. T-E-A-G-U-E. Okay. And what year and date? I was born April 12th. 1922. Okay. So I'm almost 84. You know, I, I tell you, everybody I've interviewed this week, we've been surprised how well you all, you must take good care of yourself. Well, everybody did in those days. You walked a lot. You didn't have television and that sort of thing to trap you in a chair, you know. And you walked everywhere you went. So you built good muscles and bones. We ate a lot differently. You know, most of our food came right off of the land we lived on. Not McDonald's, huh? <laughs> Hadn't even heard of it. That was after World War II. <laughs> yeah. What, when you were a little girl, what did little girls of your era want to grow up and be when you were a little girl? I just wanted to grow up and get out of town. You know, I was, I was a tomboy. I, I climbed lots of trees. And never spent time in the house unless I absolutely had to. So I was an adventurer. I always wanted to just get out. Uh, my mother wanted at least one of us girls, she had five of us, to be a nurse. But, oh, that was something I never wanted to do. And then I thought, okay, uh, what's adventurous? So then, you know, they started having airline stewardesses. I thought, that's for me. I'll be that. And I found out I had to be a nurse. This was before World War II. And I thought, no, I can't do that. So I figured, I just got to get out of town and find what I'm going to do. Was that a, a lot of the young girls at that time, nurses, teachers, is that kind that, of? That was it. Uh, either you were a teacher or you went into nursing or you worked in a store. A lot of women were still doing um, a telephone operator. You know, they still had those number please things. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, that went on until after World War II that you had an operator that you went through in some areas. Yeah, and now on. But you had to get out of town. And I went to college, but um, I was too young in my mind to really be a good college student. And so after the first a uh, year, I dropped out and I went to Upper State New York, to Ilion, New York. It's up in the Mohawk Valley, beautiful area. My sister was living there, so I went to visit and I got a job. That was my first wartime job with Remington Arms. They made, you know, Remington rifles. Well, they were gearing up for the war and uh, I worked there for four months. Uh, doing e-bonds. I took care of the e-bonds. And, of course, they were all deducted from people's salaries. They signed up for them, and I had to see to it that they were issued. Anyway, I stayed there for four months, and then I came back to Texas, and I went to work for the uh, supervisor of shipbuilding in Orange, Texas, which is down on the coast next to Louisiana. And, oh my God, Carl, it was probably the most boring job in the whole world. Because all I did was put corrections in the uh, book of specifications for the ships that they were building. There were constantly changes that were coming in. And so I would have to paste them in the books. Like big ledger books? Yeah, type? great huge ledger books. And... Uh, no future to it, of course. So my girlfriend and I, who was also bored with her job, she was in the typing pool, we decided we'd join the Navy, and we did. And we were in the third regiment that went through boot camp. So again, I went to New York because our boot camp was in uh, Hunter College in New York City at, in the Bronx. The Navy had appropriated the college to use for our boot camp. 
and they took over the uh, uh, apartment houses that were next to the college, and they used those for our barracks, our living quarters. It was January, one of the coldest winters I ever spent in my life because we had nothing but our civilian clothes for about six weeks because it took a long time to get our uniforms. Our uniforms were designed by Bain Boucher, who was a very well-noted designer at that time. And <clears throat> the Navy was a stickler for the way the uniforms fit. So all of our uniforms were fitted by tailors. Yeah, and it took a long time to get us all fitted out, you know. So we were in civilian clothes most of the time that we were in boot camp. But once we got our uniforms, we looked pretty good. So describe the uniform to me. Uh, it was navy blue, of course. And it was not really um, a tailored. It had rounded lapels, you know, so that it was more feminine than other military uh, women's uniforms. And I think that's one reason why Shirley and I, we liked the uniforms. That's why we joined the Navy. We also thought we were going to see the world, but we didn't see the whole world. We just saw part of the U.S. How long after Pearl Harbor was it that you joined? Um, this was in, I went in, in, I joined in 1942 in, in December, but I didn't go to New York until 1943 of January. So was there a patriotic element, or was it more anything to get out of Teague, Texas? Well, yeah, there was patriotic element also. But it was more than that. We just, we were looking for something really wonderful to do. And this was our opportunity. So we joined. And uh, she was called in before. She was in the 2nd Regiment. I was in the 3rd Regiment. And I never saw her after we joined <laughs> until after the war was over. That happened to a lot of people, though, who joined together, and then they never saw each other until it was over with. But while we were in boot camp, we did a lot of marching, and we did a lot of calisthenics, and they tested us a lot, and they did a lot of orientation. We were confined to the campus. And uh, until after we got our uniforms, then they gave us one Sunday that we could go down to Manhattan. And that was something because in the first place, we didn't know how to get down there. So, you know, we were from the sticks and here we were in New York City. And they, gave, they told us what L's to catch back and forth so that we didn't get too lost. But we got down down and it, was nothing like we thought it would be because it was during the war and there were no cars downtown. Uh, nobody could afford to drive a car because you couldn't get the gasoline. You know, it was all rationed. And it was on a Sunday morning and it was bleak downtown New York. But we did do some touring. We went to the top of the Empire State Building and first we got some food. That was our main thing, get good food and spent maybe about five hours downtown before we went back out to the Bronx. But it was a wonderful experience because I have not been back to New York City since. I'd like to go back and see what the difference is 60 years later. Well, anyway, at boot camp, they tested us to see what field they should put us into, you know, what work we should do. And since I'd always had good eye-hand coordination, they picked Aviation Metalsmith School for me. I hadn't the faintest idea what Aviation Metalsmiths did, but I, I could find out. And from there I went to um, Norman, Oklahoma, where the school was for Aviation Metalsmiths. And very different from New York City because it's out in the middle of Oklahoma, south of Oklahoma City, as a matter of fact. 
And right now, they're, they're, the two towns are a megapolis, but then you had to take a, a trolley between the two towns, a matter of about 30 miles. And very hot, wind blew all the time. Was it a base or was it? Yes, it was. It was else? the Navy base in Oklahoma. What was the name of the base? Uh, Naval Training Base, U.S. Navy Training Base, and uh, they trained metal smiths and they trained mechanics. There probably were other schools there also, but I didn't encounter them. And I was there for about four months. I think it took about four months to get that type of training. And I loved it. I'd never done anything like that before. And it was very interesting. And I learned how to do it well. And I was so excited about it. And I wrote my mother and dad. And I said, you know, I'm learning how to weld metal, aluminum, which is very difficult to do, you know, because it just disappears if you're not careful. Anyway, I got this letter back from my dad. And he said, Sister, I think you better go tell the man that this is not a ladylike thing to do. <laughs> so we got a lot of laughs out of that because I'm going to go to the captain. I'm going to say, you know, sir, my dad says <laughs> I can't learn how to weld because it isn't ladylike. But, you know, this is what we were battling. This mindset that women were not supposed to do that sort of thing. And we didn't realize that at the time. It was many years later that it dawned on me. I really helped break that barrier down. But of course, I did go ahead and get my uh, third uh, rating. I, got, I came out of it in aviation metal smith, third class. Were there, was it all women or was it? Men All, and women. Men and women were taking the classes, yes. But we lived in separate barracks, of course. So how did the men like having women doing well, unladylike things? You know, uh, we were well accepted by everybody that was there while we were going to school. <clears throat> but once we got stationed in a permanent uh, base, you know, the old chiefs wouldn't let us touch the planes. They'd been in for years, and this is what they had worked with, and and we were new to them, and they did not know what to do with us, and they weren't about to let us. No. So where did you get stationed then? Uh, Kingsville, Texas. I was sent to um, Corpus, and Kingsville is a pea field of Corpus. Corpus is the big Navy base, air base. And mostly amphibious planes in and out of Corpus. And then outside of Corpus were maybe three or four P fields. I can't remember all of them. One of them was Beeville, and one of them was um, Kingsville. And I was sent down to Kingsville. And it had three squadrons in it. And our only, the only reason why the base existed was to train cadets how to be fighter pilots. And uh, there were three squadrons of them that, that were instructing. And I was in one of the squadrons, 14 Charlie. And I loved it, you know. We had been issued coveralls, just like the big guys wore, you know. And we wore those to work, and we went to work in a hangar, and we got down there, and they won't let us do anything. And, of course, because we could not work at our rating, we had no chance to advance. You, you have to work at your rating if you're going to advance it. So we all ended up working in offices or, you know, I was kind of a jack of all trades. If they needed me in a tower, they would send me up there to do work. If they needed me to... Um, help out in an office. I would go in there and work. I just kind of shuffled around the base. But when, when I first got down to Kingsville, there were eight waves on the base. The rest of them were all men. We rattled around in this great big old barracks. And 
for about six or eight months after I got there. There were only us eight. Nobody knew what to do with us, you know, because they weren't set up for waves. But they finally started shipping more waves down because there were more women joining the service. And by the time I left there in 1945, there were two barracks full of waves that were working on the base. And what our purpose was, was to take the place of men so that the men could go overseas because we were not allowed aboard ship. We were not allowed overseas. The only place we could go that was off the continental United States was Hawaii. And uh, that sounded wonderful. I, I put in for that. And actually, I got orders to go to Hawaii. But by that time, I had met Bill and we were going to get married. And so I, I turned the orders down and stayed in Kingsville. Was Bill Navy? No, he was Marine. Had but they he, get attached to the gun. Well, <laughs> see, the Marines take their training through the Navy. And once they get through with all of their training, it's their choice. If they want to go into the Marines, then they, they can, or else they stay in the Navy, one of the two. And he always wanted to be in the Marines, so, but he had to go through the Navy. So he was a naval cadet all through his training until he graduated, and then he graduated as a Marine. And he's still a Marine because, you know, once a Marine, you're always a Marine. And <laughs> Yeah, it is one of the most phenomenal things I have ever encountered in my life, the closeness that these men have to each other. We still get together every year with his old squadron out of Seattle. I have uh, one good Marine buddy, Don Newbold. He was World War II, and he was at Evo. And mm -hmm. uh, I, when he talks to me, man, he says, Semper Fi at the end. I'm so honored. I mean, it, I mean, you now it just yes, I, and I understand what you're saying. And Bill wears his Marine cap, you know, ball cap, and no matter where we go, we hear Semper Fi, Semper Fi. It's just a rapport that you never see in any other organization, and that's a shame because, my goodness, if we had that throughout, even throughout the corporate world, just think, Carl, what they could do. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Did you ever get to use your skills that they taught you? Never. So you showed up, you got the coveralls on, you came down to the hangar and... Never got, never got to touch another torch, never got to even rivet. They wouldn't even let me bend, uh, we were called bend, uh, tin benders, you know, that was the slang words. Would not let me use any of the machinery. The chief was just adamant. On the other hand, I was sent to another squadron to do book work for a, a chief that was uh, head of the whole line, you know. And he had been in the Navy. In fact, he was on the first aircraft carrier. And it was a makeshift. It was an old sh uh, battleship that they put a, a platform on and landed the planes on it. And he was the sweetest thing in the whole world. He embraced us. He could not do enough for us waves. If I had been sent to his squadron first, I would have kept on doing what I was trained to do. But by that time, you know, I had been out of it for well over a year, almost two years. So do you remember the first day that you got to, to the base where you were stationed at and you showed up and your cover was ready to go to work? I mean, how did they treat you or not treat you? I mean, did they just stare at you or what did they? No. <laughs> they just acted like I was there for decoration. And that was another thing that we had to battle during uh, that period of our lives. We, there was a lot of, of um, information that went out about women that were in the service that was very untrue. And it never bothered me because, you know, I don't pay much attention to what other people say. But some of the women were very disturbed about it. And I had a friend who was married to a man that was in the Army. 
And he had been sent to Europe and spent his whole Army career in Europe. And she didn't join the Navy until after he was in Europe. And he kept writing her all these terrible things that he was hearing about women that were in the service. And they eventually got a divorce because she just could not convince him that she was in there to do her job. And that was it. So what type of, that said you were floozies or? Well, I'll tell you about this. Uh, many, many years later, we were with a friend who was in the Navy and he had spent his career on, uh, he was a corpsman, and he had spent his career on a ship going back and forth between the Orient somewhere and Seattle. So the only women he came in contact with were Navy nurses. And Navy nurses have always been there. You know, waves were different from Navy nurses. And he said to me one time, uh, I know what you women in the service were for. And I said, oh yeah, Stan, what was that? And he said, you were there to sleep with the officers. Well, you know, I'm so t sick of it by now. I said to him, now Stan, that's not exactly true. Some of us slept with you enlisted men also. <laughs> he got up and went home. <laughs> But, you know, we, had, we really had to fight this our whole career, and even after. It was a mindset that people had. That's the only reason why we, that was the only reason why we could have even wanted to join, was so that we could be with men. Well, it wasn't, for pity's sakes, no matter where we lived, there were men. It's interesting because the history books have... Um Kind of left that part out. I know, they do because mm, who wants to talk about it? But it still grates on my sensitivities that people didn't accept us this in the same spirit that they accepted the men who went in the service. It's interesting too because, and I never thought about that. The whole service part puts even a different element because you have the Rosie the Riveters facing some of that That's too right. mm -hmm. but when yes, they showed you're up right. I wonder if they were more accepted or less accepted uh, you know I really don't know because I've never discussed this with anybody that did that kind of work during World War II um, in fact most of the women I knew did not go into the service. My family did not want me to go into the service because, as as you can see, they thought it was just I was going to hell in a handbasket. And they, my dad had never been involved in the service, so he did not appreciate what being military meant. And it really did have a stigma to it. It doesn't anymore because women are very well accepted now as going into the military and doing the same job that the men does, to a certain extent. When you came home after being in the service, did your dad's attitude change? No, he still thought I should not have gone in. Mm -mm. So but by the time I got out of the Navy, I was uh, married to Bill, so, you know, he did not say much to me about that. In fact, they were so thrilled that I married Bill, they just figured, you know, boy, is he our salvation. I, they, he had rescued me from the Navy, and I didn't feel like that at all. It was one of the most amazing experiences I ever lived through in my life because I was with people from every clime of life that there is, Having been raised in a small town, I'd lived a pretty sheltered life. But I learned that there were a lot different people out there than just those that are in a small town. And I had to learn how to get along with them. We showered together. We lived in the, so close in barracks. You know, we were in bays that had... Uh, four to a bay and there were probably 120 in a barracks 
So you really, once we got more than just the eight of us, I started longing for that big barracks after a while. But when I couldn't get into the shower, it was always filled up. But it was um, an amazing experience. And I would not have traded it for anything. I, I have two daughters, and I had always wanted one of them to have that same experience just so that they could live through it. But they didn't. You know, by that time they came. Uh, that sort of experience had kind of gone by the wayside. Women were doing more of what they wanted to do. I assume that all the women in your barracks were Caucasian. No. Oh, really? No. So they weren't discriminatory? No, not at all. African American? Yes. Yes. Japanese? No. Well, not in Texas. No, that's right. You know, because, um, in fact, I did not encounter any Orientals until I moved to the West Coast with Bill after the war. They just, you know, America really wasn't not that homogenized during, until after World War II. When I went to New York for the first time, the reason I got a job at that place, they didn't have a job when I walked in, but they liked my Texas accent. They had never heard it before. And so they decided, yeah, we really do need somebody to take care of these E-bonds, and so they gave me a job. And it wasn't until after the war when all of these people who had been in the service went back home and they found out, oh, I don't have to live here. I can live in Seattle or the, or the state of Washington. I can live in Texas. I can live in California, especially California. That's where a lot of people migrated to after the war. But it was very unusual if you knew anyone other than your own town before World War II. So some of the women that you uh, served with, where were they from? Do you remember names? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One was Sherry. She was from New York. One was Larry. She was from California. Uh, one was from Oklahoma. And my friend Sunday, who went with me to New York when we first went up to boot camp, uh, she was from Fort Worth. And she, she and I went through the same training and stayed together the entire service. And she moved back to Fort Worth and lived there after she got out of the service. But uh, I had a friend from Virginia. I knew a lot of people from the New England states. Uh, a lot of our waves that went in at the same time I did were from the East Coast. And there were not too many from the West Coast yet for some reason, I do not know. Later, they came in, but not at first. And I suppose it's because communication wasn't that great during those days. Our only communication was newspapers or radio. And they were always maybe two or three days late with their news, you know. And that's one reason why, um, what's his name, that was in New York, I mean, in London during the war. They just made a movie. Oh, oh yeah, Murrow. Murrow. That's the reason why he was so phenomenal. It's because he was right there, almost at the front. And he was the first reporter to ever report directly from where the action was happening via radio. And that was what was so remarkable about him. Of course, now they're right in the middle. Of course, we had people like Ernie Pyle, who was a reporter and was right at the front with the troops, but his information did not come out until it was sent out, and sometimes it was weeks before it came out. And his was a different style of reporting. But um, there were a lot of things that were different. And sometimes I forget what the difference is because I've grown so accustomed to what it is, has grown to be now. But we were rationed. We couldn't buy shoes. Even if you were in the service, you couldn't buy shoes unless you had ration tickets. And, uh, of course, uh, foodstuffs like butter and sugar and stuff like that, we didn't have to worry about because that was 
all provided for us. But you get all the SOS you wanted, huh? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I very seldom ate at the <laughs> come at the yeah at the uh, mess hall because the food was the, when they you know the Navy had the best bakers in the whole world and they made these great huge donuts I mean they're much better than the Krispy Kremes now but that's the only time that most of us ladies would go over and eat when we knew they were making those donuts and serving them. When you went to, to New York the first time, were you in uniform when you went with your friend? When I went up, no. When I went to New York, I went by myself the first time. I went to visit my sister who was living in Upper State, New York. And I went alone. And uh, when I went back, I went with my friend to New York City. Were you in uniform? No. We were in civilian clothes. So do you remember going off base the first time in the uniform? Yeah, it's when we went to Manhattan that Sunday and um, the day I described to you where Times Square was just, you know, barren. And we found a USO and uh, wanted really instructions from the people there as to what we could do, what was available for us. Were there any shows going on? Could we go to a movie? They weren't even showing movies, or none of the stage plays were happening. And really, it was a disappointment because we just expected so much. We'd heard so much about New York City, but that was the first time we ever went anywhere in our uniform. Now, I know the men... When they went anywhere in the uniform, I hear the story. Anywhere you went, they'd buy you a meal, they'd buy you a drink. They mm -hmm. would. What about women in uniform? No. No. We bought our own meals. We bought our own drinks. Did, did we were curiosity. And people looked at us and treated us like a curiosity. Maybe it got different later. But when I first went in, it was not like that at all. Did they ask you questions? No. So they didn't even say, it was more like looking at a handicapped person where they kind of... Yeah, it was like, you know, and of course, we were not alone. There was always four or five of us together. Because when you're in the service, you don't do anything by yourself. You go everywhere with someone else. And usually there's five or six of you that are... Even when we started going out on dates at, in Kingsville... It, you never had a date by yourself. That was just dumb. You just, a whole bunch of you went out together and had a great time. And mainly we were looking for a place to dance and have a beer and spend an evening, and that was it. And that's how I met my husband. He was a blind date. And um, we went to the city park with about 10 other people. And somebody had iced down a case of beer and we were sitting around. Again, it was during the war. Everything was black. You had no street lights. All the houses had uh, those blackout shades. And I didn't even know what he looked like because in Texas, when the sun goes down, it, you know, it gets black immediately. Anyway, uh, I didn't know what he looked like until about three weeks later when somebody pointed him out to me that this was the guy I had gone out with that night. Anyway, that was the way it worked. It, now, when you met him, were you in uniform? Or you, oh, was, yes. Oh, you were? Oh, yes. So now, how did military, here's a Marine and now a Navy woman and all the things that you'd said about, did he respect it? Or did oh, he, yeah. Oh yeah, the guys, the guys on the base knew us, you know, the ones you worked with knew you, and we got all the respect in the world on the base. But it's when we went off the base, and every once in a while, the Navy had this wonderful little trick of reminding the local people that their money came from the base, their economy was set up by the base mainly and they would pay us in $2 bills. They'd give us our pay in $2 bills. 
And when those $2 bills started hitting town, people would have changed their attitude about a service person who came in. But it wasn't just the waves, it was also the sailors as well and the Marines. They were, we had overrun the town. You know, it was, Kingsville was a small town. And <clears throat> so they were not, un, they were not too happy that we had just moved in and taken over their town, which we really hadn't. Most of us lived on the base. We had to. But when we had a um, minute to get away from the base, we only went into Kingsville because very few people had a car and you only traveled by bus or you walked or train if you were going a great distance. So you didn't really go into town very often except in the evenings or on the weekends. So they were glad though once the money started. Oh yeah, once those two dollar bills started showing up. They were... it's, it's interesting growing up here. Mm -hmm. um, I know um, for a long time, not while any of the wars were going on, but with Fort Lewis being by, they always talk about the army dogs mm -hmm. in, a, in a derogatory sense. Mm -hmm. But we never heard that about the Navy because Bremerton was further away. Now I assume right. in Bremerton they have some derogatory thing for... Probably, yeah. yeah. And anytime anything goes wrong, it's always, oh, well, they're probably in the Navy. They're probably in the Army, which isn't true. They're just as human beings as anybody else. They're doing a different job with a uniform on, that's all. What, what was the plane that... Uh, uh, you would have been working on? Were oh, those were the training planes, and they were called SNJs. We lovingly called them Js. And they were a two-seater, one behind the instructor in front, the student behind. And um, they looked sort of like... Uh, one of the fighter planes, I can't remember exactly which one it is, but but they were a good little plane. They had a wonderful engine in them that took a lot of beating because uh, learning how to fly is a very difficult thing. And there were more cadets killed, more flyers killed learning how to fly <clears throat> than they were in combat. That sort of information did not get out, but I saw two mid-air crashes myself. One was during the day, and I was at the swimming pool, and I looked up, and, and two planes went together, and it seemed like the parts fell for hours, you know. And then the other one was in the middle of the night, and it was worse because you could see the fire, you know, during the day, the fire didn't show up but it was not it was not an easy thing to to live through but that information didn't get out simply because communication was different in those days so if you'd been able to do your job mm -hmm. your job would have been to repair any flaws that were in the surface of the airplane the mechanics took care of the mechanical part of it, the engines, all that sort of thing. But ours was strictly the um, skin of the airplane. Huh. Wow. And I would have loved doing it, you know. I could have stayed out and been Rosie the Riveter, but I don't think it would have been nearly as interesting, nor as rewarding. Um, it took a lot of years for people to start recognizing that we women really did contribute something to the war effort. Because even after uh, years after I got out of the service, uh, someone would say, you know, where were you during the war? And I'd say I was in the Navy. And they'd say, oh, and that was it. But now, People are beginning, like you, your group, they're beginning to realize that we, as well as the Rosie the Riveters, contributed to the war effort. And I'm glad that that's happening. And mainly I'm glad that we plowed that ground to open up a new field for the 
women that came after us. It's just like you said, you, you, you get so used to what's here now mm -hmm. that you forget what, what it was like. What it was like, yeah, yeah back then. Because a young woman of today, anything they want to do, they can go do. That's right. Their dad's not going to write them and say, oh, well, that's not very ladylike. No, it isn't. And there's no dad that would dare say that to their daughter now. But, and dad never did get to the point where he was really happy that I was in the service. Nor did mother. But that's okay. Were there boys in the family or just girls? Yeah, I had a brother. Did he go in the service? Yes, the Navy. So let me guess. How and I got blamed for that. <laughs> they didn't want him to go in the service either. So how were they to him, though? Were they like, oh, oh yeah, the star? Well, and... well that was different, you know. Anytime a, a man goes into uniform, it's a different situation. But I hope it's different for the women now. Every once in a while, I'll see a wave, and I sit down, if I have an opportunity, and talk to them. And th their experience in the Navy is so different from what mine was that it's phenomenal. You know, it, like everything else, it's progressed, and it's like a job now. Whereas during the war, it was not a job. It, you were in service. That's what you were. The people that over, at boot camp, all women overseeing mm -hmm. you? And then when you went to your training, men and women teachers? Or yes, women? men teachers. Men teachers. Men teachers, yeah. yes. And they accepted you there? Oh, yes. It was when you finally showed up that they were you were really going to do what you were trained to do, and they went. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it happened to be the individual chiefs, you know. Like I said, some of the chiefs were wonderful and allowed us to do their jo our job. But there were only certain compliments enough that we could fill. If they did not need any more aviation metalsmiths then in their squadron, then we couldn't go and work with those that would accept us waves. So we spent our time. Well, I had an enjoyable time. I was with special services, and I sang with the band, and we played um, gigs at um, USOs and special occasions like Fourth of July in town, and and we did concerts at a variety of uh, venues, and it was a lot of fun. But that was just sort of a sideline to my daytime job. And that was definitely acceptable because a woman singer. Oh yeah. Oh, women can do that. Absolutely. So they let me do that. F favorite song when you were singing. Uh. You know, you will not know this song, but it was just one of those cute little catchy tunes. They it was Milkman, keep those bottles quiet. And it was about somebody that worked all night on the line, you know, and came home to sleep during the day, and the milkman always came rattling the bottles, which is different now because milk doesn't come in bottles, and it's not delivered by a milkman. <laughs> but they, you know, they wrote a song about almost everything in those days. And did you, you had sung before? Oh, yes, yeah. all my life. Back in Teague? Oh, yeah. So did the Navy get you out of Teague? Yes, permanently. <laughs> so, so a mission accomplished. Mission accomplished, huh. yes. Wow. What a pleasure. Thank you. I mean, it's, been, it's been good talking about it. Did you, um, you didn't have to go? The uh, Dyson Council was having a meeting downtown in one of the hotels. Skip and I went down in the bar and had a drink together while they were having their little meeting. And so we were talking about him being in Corpus at the same time. No, I didn't run into him. Uh, yeah, Corpus was a great big base. You know, it was a huge base. Still is. And Kingswall was just a tiny little thing. So once I was, I was only in Corpus for about a week before they sent me on down to Kingswall. He had a little, uh, little trio. 
Did he? And uh, yeah, and I still have a recorder somewhere of it. It was, you know, when you used to record the records and send yeah. them home to, to his grandma, and it was to, to mud. Not like today. And so when you sang, was it um, USO clubs or officers clubs or? Uh, I was not allowed to go into the officers clubs. The band could, but I couldn't. Because? I was away. Enlisted. They were enlisted also, but they were men. So if you'd been just a woman and not enlisted, could you yeah. go in? And... Oh, sure. Oh, but because yeah. you were a woman in a wave, yeah. not in the officer's club, they even right. entertained. Mm -hmm. We also had a man that sang with the band. His name was Edo Scataglia. Now, you see, I would never have met an Edo, Edo Scataglia in Teague. He was a lovely man. And when they performed at the old clubs, Edo went with them because he was a man and he sang. And of course, all the young men in those days tried to emulate Frank Sinatra and he did a pretty fair job of it. He had a very nice voice and, and it was delightful. What was your rank? I was third class. And that was, it sounds like, as high as you could go as a woman? That was it. That's the very bottom of the ladder. You know, once you've gotten through school, and they automatically give you third class rating. And you go from there up to second class, first class, and on up, until you reach chief. That's the highest. Our warrant officer is the highest, non-commissioned. When did you leave the service? I left it in May of 1945. So that was the end of your, you had served your time? And yes. No, I had gotten pregnant with my oldest son. And they did, in those days, they did not want pregnant women in the service, even if you were married. You know, they weren't happy that I was married. If I had married, uh, if Bill had been in the Navy when I married him, I would have automatically been discharged. Because in those days, the wisdom of the guys up that made the decisions was that no husband and wife should be in the same branch of the service. And because he was Marine, I, was, I stayed in uh, for another well, we were married in September, and I got out in April or May, something like that. But by that time, I had gotten pregnant with Mike, and they were happy to get rid of me. But it was right after that that the war was over anyway, so I would have gotten out that year sometime. Did they terminate you, or you, because you were pregnant, did you have to leave, or? Mm -hmm. So if you got pregnant, they said, thank that's you very it. much? Yep, that's it. Mm-hmm. Gave me my two hundred dollars, and that was to get me back to my starting base, home, and that was it. And also to buy some civilian clothes. And two hundred dollars in nineteen forty-five went a long way. And I did need civilian clothes. Maternity civilian clothes. Maternity <laughs> civilian clothes. I never thought. I never knew that. I didn't know that uh, uh, both of those that, that it married in the same branch. They didn't like. Oh, it was only during World War II. I think very shortly after that that they got rid of that little ruling, which was rather ridiculous. But I'll tell you something that happened. I had uh, made good friends with a man called uh, Lieutenant Twenty, was his name, and he was um, he was um, a lawyer from Chicago. A defense lawyer, which my oldest son is now, and um, I had become very close friends with him, uh, my girlfriend Peg and I had, and when I was in the, after I had gotten married, I got a call from him one day, and he was the personnel officer on the base at Kingsville, and he called me in and sat me down, he said, now I want to tell you this, Diz, what I've done. He said, I put in a request for a discharge for you. And he said, I filled everything in the way that it's supposed to be, except I did not indicate that Bill was a Marine. And he said, it does not have your signature on it at all. 
sound like a defense lawyer. Uh, he said, it's only signed by myself and my, uh, oh, what do they call those people that did clerical work? Oh, I okay. can't. I, don't mean what, yeah. I can't remember what they were called in those days. Anyway, they're called something different now. Anyway, he said, we're hoping that once it hits uh, back in Washington, D.C., it'll be one of those days when they just go through and sign everything, you know. it's They're so busy. But it may be that they will take a look at it and see that it has to be tossed out. And he said, there just might be some sort of kickback and you... If the captain calls you in about it, I want you to know that you're not libeled because you knew nothing about it when it happened. I said, okay, that's me, but what about you and your uh, uh, assistant? He said, don't worry about us. We just got orders to go to the South Pacific, and we're not going to be on the base. So. <laughs> and, you know, in those days... During the war, if you were on a base and you fouled up somehow, to punish you, they sent you to the South Pacific. They sent you to the war zone. And Bill said, when he was flying, he was an instructor, and he said he and the other guys always tried to do something to get sent to the South Pacific. And then they found out later that where these guys got sent was some little atoll out there that they were there for maintenance, you know, of just the island. <laughs> they never went anywhere or did anything. So it was kind of like being put in prison. So the, let me switch tapes.